So the, the psalm that we'll be looking at today, Psalm 86, is a, a prayer of, of King David during a very difficult time in his life. His life is threatened by people who want to destroy him. David's prayer shows us that those who trust in him, they know him, and therefore they depend upon him, they call upon him, and they seek to glorify him during times of adversity. So let's look at our text today, Psalm 86. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart. And I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life. And they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame. Because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Uh, The first point I want to, to look at in our text this afternoon is to remember your covenant relationship with the Lord and his character during times of adversity. Remember your covenant relationship with the Lord and God's character during times of adversity. David uses a good portion of this psalm to describe God. Uh, As we sang about this afternoon, um, God has characteristics. And David uses language that speaks of God's covenant relationship with his people and also describes God's character describes who God is. Why does David spend so much time doing this? And I think it is to encourage us to remember our relationship with God and God's good character during times of him. We call upon him and we seek his glory during times of adversity. And so we need to remember our covenant relationship with God during times of adversity. David starts off his prayer by calling on the Lord. In verse 1, we read, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. And the word, O Lord, is a, a translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh. God used a lot of names in the Old Testament to describe himself. And Yahweh was the special name that God used whenever he was talking to his special people about their special relationship. It was a name that was personal to the Israelites. So whenever God made big promises to his people, he used this name. And so we see God constantly make and remind his people, uh, remind his people of himself by using this name. And God makes big promises to his people through this name, like promises to, to be with his people always to provide what his people need to protect his people. 
David knows Yahweh and the love and compassion he has for his covenant people. He knows that he is faithful to show his people compassion during their times of need. This is why he says he is poor and needy. He trusts that God will be faithful to him and have compassion on him by answering his prayer during his time of need because God is Yahweh, who is his covenant God. God doesn't take his covenant promises lightly. As you, you take communion today, listen to Jesus' words when Ajanati reads 1 Corinthians 11. Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And it is by the blood of Jesus that God has made a covenant with us. This covenant is not some simple pinky promise that God makes that he will easily break. During times of adversity, remember your relationship with your covenant Lord and the promises that he has given you. Promises to never leave you, to never forsake you, to provide what you need. We are God's people, and he is with us and for us and has proven that we are his by the blood of his son. In verses 5, David also speaks of God's character. In verses 5 and 15, he lists several of God's characteristics. He says that, that God is good. God doesn't have any evil intent to harm his people. He only has good for them. God is forgiving. This means that God is able to look past the sins that David has committed and not hold those sins against him. God is able to answer David's prayer because he is forgiving. God is abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon him. This love that is spoken of here is the love God has for his covenant people. God's steadfast love, it means that it is constant and God's love never ends. God's love for us, it, it never dries up. It never ceases to exist because God has a never-ending supply of love and we are his people. Notice in verses 4 through 5 that God's character is what encourages David to ask for, um, for what he does. In verse 4, David asks and says, Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Verse 5, how does it start? It starts with four. So it has given us the, the reason why David prays the way he does in verse 4. David knows God's character, and he trusts him, so he confidently depends on him and prays to him. When our neighbors moved next door to us a few years ago, we slowly started getting to know them. We saw each other outside of, of our houses, and so we would talk through the bushes that separate our houses. And we did, did this a few t times, and then they invited us over to their house for non and to, to visit. And after a short time of getting to know them, they offered to, to watch our two young girls. And, and this was nice. It was uh, nice to know that they had offered that. And the wife of the family would invite Macy over to her house to play. We didn't know the family well, and so we would tell Macy, uh, no, you, you can't go over to their house right now because we don't know them well. They seem like a great family, but we just don't know them well enough to allow you to go over by yourself and play. But as we spent more and more time with them and got to know them better, we began to trust them. We started allowing Macy to spend more time with them. And they now play badminton together uh, regularly. One of the reasons that God describes himself so much in scripture is so that we can get to know his good character. He wants us to know him and trust him so that in difficult times, we turn to him. Brothers and sisters, we should all be encouraged by David's prayer to get to know the Lord better so that we trust him and turn to him in times of need. We want to make sure that we are studying the scriptures so that our hearts and our minds know him and trust him well. If we are going to depend on the Lord, we must know and trust his character. 
during times of, of difficulty in life, turn to the Psalms like Psalm 86 and other passages of Scripture that speaks of God's character and the covenant relationship that we have with God. And meditate on these two things. When we know the character of God and trust Him, it will embolden us to depend on Him, which is what we will look at next. Depend on the Lord during times of adversity. I think there are basically two ways you can look whenever adversity hits. You can look internally and depend on yourself, or you can look externally and depend on other things or other people. And David looks at both. He looks at himself, and in verse 1, he states that he is poor and needy. He realizes that he lacks the ability to handle the adversary that is against him. And at some point, he looks around him and he looks at the world. He looks at what the world of his day has to offer him to help in his situation. And the best it can offer is false gods. He says in verses 7 through 10, In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. David is saying to God, you alone are God. There is nothing and there is no one that compares to you. I will depend upon you during times of adversity because everything else is less than you are. What does David depend on the Lord for? In verse 2, he depends on the Lord to preserve his life. In verse 4, to gladden his soul. David is joyless at, at, at this point. Um, he has been plagued by his enemies who are after his life, and so they have robbed him of his joy. In verse 11, he says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And so David wants to know how he is to conduct himself in this world. He wants to do it in a way that glorifies and honors the Lord. In verse 16, he says, Give your strength to your servant. David needs to be strengthened by the Lord. And in verse 17, Show me a sign of your favor. And so Nothing in this world is more capable or more willing to be helped to us during our times of adversity than our covenant God. When adversity comes our way, we need to depend upon the Lord to meet all of our needs that are a result of the ad adversity that we experience. Each adversity is different and will require us to depend on the Lord in different ways. But He is able to handle whatever it is that we face. One of Ford's slogans is built for tough. They, they often have uh, commercials uh, and billboards to advertise their vehicles. And the truck commercials are, are usually some type of, of rugged guy who's in a car heart, and he's driving a truck through some harsh terrain like a desert or snow or rain or, or up a mountain. And the point the producers are trying to communicate to us is that nothing can stop this truck from getting you through whatever conditions you need to go through. It can handle whatever is in its way. So when adversity arises, what is your tendency? Do you look to yourself and say, I've gotten through cancer and I can do it again? Do you tell yourself, I have an appointment next week with a specialist at a nearby hospital who is the best in the world who says he can stop this cancer? Do you go on chat GPT to find out if AI, if AI could give you an instant cure? Or do you depend upon the Lord for help? Our text today encourages us to look to the Lord for our help. The Lord may provide a great specialist for you to see. He may use chat GPT to give you knowledge but our help is ultimately found in the Lord. Don't depend on these other things. In and of themselves, they are like the false gods of David's time that don't compare to God. Let's look now at our third point, 
pray to the Lord during times of adversity. David's dependency on and trust in the Lord moves him to call upon the Lord and pray to him during his time of need. Um, in verses 6 through 7, David says, Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. David calls upon the Lord because of past experience. He has called upon the Lord before and asked the Lord something, and the Lord has answered. The Lord has provided. And so this experience has given David great confidence that the Lord will help him in his time of need now and answer the other prayers that he prays for help. Hebrews 4, 16 tells us, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so God invites us to come to him during our time of need. He uses our prayers to bless us during times of adversity. Remember the character of God when you pray. He is gracious. Trust that the Lord answers the prayers of his people and call upon him. Psalm 86 reminds us of another servant king who, like David, would face a band of godless men that would seek to take his life. Like David, he would, intense, uh, he would experience intense suffering and sorrow because of them. And he would rely upon the strength of the Lord and cry out to the Lord for help. Right before Jesus went to die on the cross, he prayed. His prayer gives us additional instructions how to pray during times of adversity. Let's take a look at this prayer and see what it has to teach us. We find an account of this prayer in Luke 22, verses 39 through 47. And it says, And he came out and went as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. While he was still speaking, there came a crowd. And the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. So Jesus is stricken with sorrow because he knows his time to go to the cross was approaching. The godless band of men who wanted to take his life was on his front doorstep. And how does Jesus pray? He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knows that the pain and the agony that he will soon face at the cross when the Father looks upon him as having committed all of the sins of us, of all the sins of all of his covenant people. The wrath and the fury of God for this amount of sin would be intense, and Jesus would experience the full force of it. Jesus wanted to avoid experiencing this if it was possible, if there was any way other way possible for him to, for God the Father to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish, Jesus wanted to know, let's do that, Father. But if there wasn't, then Jesus wanted to do the Father's will. He knows and trusts in the character of our Father. And he is therefore willing to subject himself and his plans to the Father's plans. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, it tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways declares, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
God has this wonderful overarching plan for all of creation. And we need to take this into account when we pray to him during times of adversity. We can boldly approach him and boldly ask our gracious and loving God for help during times of adversity with the expectation that he hears us and he does answer our prayers, that he does give us good things. But at the same time, we need to remember that our ways, our plans, our desires are not always the same as his. We need to subject our prayer request to his will. And we need to acknowledge this in our prayers and the way that we formulate our prayers. Our prayers should communicate to God that he knows best and that we are subject to his will and desires. All the same, all, all while at the same time making those requests that we have known to him. Romans 8, 28, it tells us that God has a plan and a purpose for all things in our lives, even adversity. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. So even in those times when it's God's plan for us to experience great adversity and hardship and not to remove it, we can take comfort knowing that our good, gracious, merciful, and steadfast loving God is in charge and has good in mind for us. And let's look now at our last point. Seek the glory of the Lord during times of adversity. We see David's passion for, for God's glory throughout this psalm. He shows concern for God's glory in three ways in particular. And the first way we see David's passion for God's glory is in his desire for God to be glorified among the nations. In verses 7 through 10, we read, In the day of my trouble I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. And so we see that the, David wants the, the people of other nations to stop worshiping their false gods and to worship the true God. David compares the one true God with these false gods and says that they cannot compare. The Lord does great and wondrous things, and these false gods do not. God alone is mighty and wonderful, but the people of these other nations do not admit this, and they continue to worship false gods. They continue to, to praise and to give honor that should be given to the Lord to these false gods. Uh, we see David's concern here, um, and he especially talks about this in verses 14 through 17. He has a concern for God to get the glory that he so rightly deserves. All the peoples of the nations of the world will one day come and worship the Lord and honor him for his greatness and his wonderful works. We also see David's passion for God's glory and his desire for God to be glorified among those who seek to harm him. He says in verse 14, O oh God, insolent men have risen up, against, risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. The men who seek to harm David do not set the Lord before them. This means that they do not care about giving God uh, or glorifying God and giving him the honor and the worship and the praise that he deserves. In, re in response to this, David asked the Lord to show him a sign of favor. He says in verse 17, show me a sign of favor that those who hate me. He wants them to come to know the Lord and be put to shame for not glorifying him. These men do not set the Lord before him, before them. David has a, a great concern for the glory of God. He wants for God to show up and intervene so that these men are put to shame and they see God. These men have no reverence or respect for God. And David wants 
God to show up and show his character. He wants God to show his mercy, his grace, how he is slow to anger, how he is abounding in steadfast love and his faithfulness to David so that these men see it. We can and we should pray confidently like this for ourselves and others in times of adversity. God, show up and show your power by overcoming this trouble and saving me from it. Show your strength, show your grace, show your mercy that you are slow to anger, you are abounding in steadfast love. Show your faithfulness to me by rescuing me from this adversity so that your glory will just be displayed in the world. And lastly, we see David's passion for God's glory and his desire for himself to glorify God. When we go through adversity and, and hardship, it's easy to lose sight of our overarching purpose in life, which is to glorify God. I know at least for me, this is how it usually works. It seems like the, the more things don't go my way and the more troubles and hardships that I experience, the more I tend to focus on those problems around me and not on the Lord and not on His glory, not on glorifying the Lord. And so I often lose sight of how wonderful the Lord is. And my heart's focus, it shifts from God's glory to my problems. And so my problems, they, they act like the moon and that they eclipse God's glory and his greatness. I think one of the things that David is doing in this psalm is keeping the Lord before our face during this time of trouble. He has given us an example to follow of how to pray in times of adversity. He shows us a prayer that meditates on the Lord so that we get to a place where David is in verses 11 through 12. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. I will glorify your name forever. When we remember the greatness of God, it puts things into perspective. David prays for his own heart. He wants all of his life, including his conduct, to conform to one purpose, which is to honor and glorify the Lord forever. He wants a heart that wholly seeks the glory of the Lord, even in the midst of adversity. And notice how it is only after Davis, David has gotten to this point that he really gets into detail of what he's going to, to go before the Lord about his problem. In verse 14, he says, O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. And so as we look at David's prayer, he's meditated upon the Lord. He's gone before the Lord um, before he even brings uh, details up to the Lord about the adversity that he's experiencing. He teaches us to keep God and his glory in the front of our minds. And how does Jesus teach us to pray? How does he start the Lord's Prayer that we, most of us, know well? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So brothers and sisters, during times of adversity, let us remember our covenant relationship with the Lord and his character so that we may depend upon him, call upon him, and glorify him in our time of need. Let's go before the Lord and thank him for his word and ask him to work his word into our hearts. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word, how you instruct us through it, how you show us your character, how you show us your covenant love for us, your covenant faithfulness. Dear Lord, I pray that you will just continue to teach us more about you, dear Lord. I pray not only that you will fill our minds with the knowledge of who you are, but I pray that you will unite our hearts, dear Lord, so that we fear you. I pray that as we, we see uh, David's heart in this, this prayer of just wanting his heart to be motivated and to be focused upon you, dear Lord, I pray that you will give us that same desire to, during adversity. I pray that you will help us to know your character and to, to trust you. I pray that during times of adversity, because we know you and we trust you, I pray that we will depend upon you, dear Lord. 
I pray that we will call upon you, and I pray that we will glorify you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.